please welcome Matt Fulmer. so lucky that I've been on both sides of a career where there was a time in my career when this never would have gotten made, and now there's a day like today where we can tell these kinds of stories with real authenticity and, and have good audience and watch them and support them. And it's really overwhelming, I have to say. So I have to always lead with that. Um, yeah. And then also getting some awards recognition. Johnny Daly won a Critics' Choice yes. Award. So yes, yeah. yeah. folks like you who supported it and, and that, that it's gotten the response it's gotten from the awards community has been great too. So let's go back to the beginning. You said three years ago you started working on this? It was longer than that. It was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, Robbie Rogers and Ron Nice Warner uh, asked me if I wanted to have a Zoom meeting. I had no idea what it was about. They brought the book to me. They told me a little bit about what it was about. I, I read it in about three days and I called them immediately and said, we have to do this. And uh, Met and talked about the project. They told me about how they wanted to expand the world and bring in Marcus and Frankie characters. And sort of thought about what those stories would be like and then how we, this whole world would play out. And Ron had this beautiful vision. He'd been sitting on the project already for five or six years. So, um, and then we went about the you know the process of selling it. And I was really skeptical. I have to be honest with you. I was I was kind of cynical and, and not like jaded, but I was just like. I don't know, like, are people gonna put this kind of money you need to put into a multi-decade gay love story? Like, I, I don't know. I had never seen it before, you know? So you have to, you know, there was nothing out there for me to grab onto and go, oh yeah, they did that. And so we were just fortunate enough that the, the folks at Showtime and now Paramount Plus and um, the folks at Fremantle really got behind the project and put their money where their mouth was and, just, you know, Ron started turning in these scripts and they just got better and better and better. And the support kept growing and growing and growing and all of a sudden it became very real. And there were so many bumps along the way where it almost didn't happen. And then it, it's one of those stories where, I'm sorry, I'm just drawing on here. But, um, that is actually over <laughs> yeah. um, No, it just like, you felt like this groundswell that we're, just knew the story was so much bigger than you, like you knew it was so much bigger than any one of the parts involved in it, um, because there would be these seeming impossible obstacles that would come up and then something would shift and like all of a sudden it would be a green light again. And um, there were, It just felt like, I don't mean to sound too esoteric, but it felt like there were these voices that just wanted to come through. Yeah, and I would love to kind of dig into that actually a little bit more emotionally because as you said, there isn't really a precedent for a series like this and it's gotten made and distributed. Um, but then at the same time, you, you immediately, you, you blew through the books and you really wanted to be part of it. So what was it kind of holding those kind of dueling feelings in hand? Oh, it was really conflicting. You know, it's one, of the <laughs> it's one of those things where I think part of the reason why I was doubtful is because I was trying to protect my own heart because I love the character in the world so much that I thought, well, if I just think it might not happen, then I won't be too heartbroken when it does. And then it just cracked it wide open when they kept saying yes and, and opening more doors. And I don't know, for me, I had never read a, a gay character like Hawk before who was sort of an anti-hero and so multidimensional and who made so many questionable choices. But at the same time, there were the characters I, I loved on Episodic in the past 10 years. If you look at Breaking Bad or, or 
Don Draper, we have this rich array of these sort of anti-hero characters on shows, and I thought, yes, finally, we're getting to, to, to open up this world as well for a, a gay character. And, uh, I'm just so glad that, um, thankfully, nobody in the creative team really shied away from that. They <laughs> leaned into it really heavily. I was like, oh, shit, we're going to do that? <laughs> and, uh, okay. And uh, thankfully, they just, they just uh, they weren't afraid to just to keep push that envelope, and so I'm grateful they did. And, and if there were characters like this that were this multifaceted and multi-layered, you know, I never got an opportunity to play them. It was always, you know, understandably from a you know financial perspective in film or something, it was going to be a, a movie star. Yeah. Um, do you remember any of those specific oh shit moments? <laughs> Ooh, I think my biggest oh shit moment. I don't know if everybody here has seen the whole show or not. <laughs> um, I think it was really in episode eight. There were all these different, first of all, there were all these different ways that our characters were going to connect uh, sexually in episode eight, and they kept all getting floated around, so we didn't know what we are going to do until about two weeks before that happened, but it was also, obviously, he turns in. Thought, oh my gosh, this is the very end of the story. Is the audience going to, you know, is this going to be irredeemable? Is it going to be unforgivable? Um, and then once it Ron did such a beautiful job, a job of, of just weaving the, the love story so beautifully that you understood, oh, as an actor, I could understand how Hawk would fit. It's so hard to actually be objective about something I was so subjective about, but. Um, why he would make that decision to protect Skippy from himself and, and save him from blowing up both of their lives. Uh, and then there's, of course, the way he structured it was so beautiful because right after that, you know, he's at the quilt. So in those early Zoom calls, were you first brought in to act or already as a producer? I was so grateful early on they brought me in uh, as a producer as well, which was, um, you know, a, a first for me. Um, that stage of the game, uh, and you know, a lot of my uh, the producing I did on this was really to with relationships and to you know weigh in on some of the casting to to um, Dan Minahan I studied under he's actually on my DGA card because we did Versace together and uh, and Simon Dennis uh, was the director of photography when I directed on that show and so we were able to kind of use relationships and assemble some creatives. Yeah, I'd actually love to dig into that more too, especially since we have a room full of actors here who are probably curious about getting into producing and yeah. wearing multiple hats on a series where you're also you're in like every other scene. Yeah, uh, so I try, it's different on every job I would say, and I wish I had a breadth of experience to tell me, well, some jobs with this and some that I really don't have a lot to compare it to. I would say this was so comprehensive once I was on set that I really tried to get a lot of the initial producing work done before we got to set so that I could really just focus on the work as an actor once I was there. And then if there was a big executive decision to make, we worked, um, I think I did 96 out of 100 days on this show, uh, which is a lot. <laughs> and there was no day that was shorter than 12 or 14 hours, especially when there were prosthetics involved. Uh, so by the time, and it was a seven day a week job, so we would shoot until four in the morning on Saturday morning, sleep for like six hours. If there were any executive decisions to kind of shore up, we would, I could weigh in on that then. And I started memorizing for the next week and then just rinse and repeat for six months. Yeah. Um, wow. And then, and then once it was imposed, honestly, you know, if I was asked to weigh in on something, I would. But it, it was so Ron's baby at that point that I didn't try to overstep my bounds as a producer. Um, I only kind of if asked. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about your working relationship with Ron, who I know has also been wanting to tell kind of bigger queer stories as well. I mean, obviously I was a fan of Ron's work since Philadelphia um, and his writing on multiple projects. I think he a, has a really prolific career if you really dig into what he's done over the years. And um, he, It's so interesting because he, he really wears one hat as a producer and another hat as a creator on set. He was there every take of every scene I did this entire shoot, which I've never had. I've been doing this almost 30 years. 
longer if you count being a background artist in a Chuck Norris movie when I was 12. <laughs> Didn't have that in your bingo card, did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, um, <laughs> so it's been a minute, and I've worked with a lot of creators, and I've worked with a lot of really dedicated creators, but I've never had somebody who had that level of commitment. So if he, you know, any note he wanted to give me on the set, I took it. He wanted me to do a cartwheel on a tape. I would try it. <laughs> Whatever he wanted, because I knew that this was his baby. I knew how important it was, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be that vessel for him and for the story and, and, and for his creation. And, um, so uh, it, it was a great working relationship on set. Uh, it never felt overly precious. He does really value his words, which I respect and. But it was never, uh, never felt oppressive or like it closed me off, you know, or felt free. I think as we get more um, different kinds of minority representation in Hollywood, something that I feel hear from a lot of people is how amazing it is to be on set and to just see so many people who are like yourself or to share the experience of the story um, with other people who know what you've been through. Um, so was it kind of like this, um, this project? Um, or what is it like now moving into a project where there are so many other queer people who just, there's a kind of a shared shorthand? It's amazing. You know, I was really spoiled because I had boys in the band as well. We, we had the whole stage experience with a, an entirely group of queer actors, and we had the film experience with the exact same creative team. So I had some of an experience of it, but <laughs> That whole world of boys and band was so vicious. That it was like um, <coughs> it was a great group of people, but th this was different. This was um, everybody, and that was a great experience. But this was just everybody. Like I said, just felt the that the story need, you know needed and wanted to be told and wanted to put themselves out of the way and just put themselves in the line to to tell that story and, and check their ego at the door. And, <laughs> really get in and dig in and do the work and uh, it, it is liberating because I spent you know 27 years of my career being the only gay person on set and most of the time you know sometimes I would have friends and I'm hair and makeup <coughs> or in the costume department or something but there were many sets where I was the only gay person and so um, it was it, it, you know, you realize, and I, I had a great experience in those too, obviously, but uh, you know, you're working with other actors, other great artists who are open, they don't care, but there is something that's, it was so nice to, to switch it and go, oh, oh yeah, we can we have a total shorthand about everything. Um, this wasn't a set that necessarily lent itself to a lot of small talk in between <laughs> takes or um, setups or anything like that, but um, there was a comfortability, I would say particularly around lend itself to, to um, not an ease, because, you know, intimacy scenes are intimacy scenes, <coughs> but just a, a, a shorthand in terms of dialogue about how, what this scene was about and what we wanted to reveal in the scene and, and what our characters were trying to express. I will be coming back to the intimacy scenes in a moment. <laughs> but just to follow up on that, especially because, like you said, you've been doing this for 30 years, to not only be in a space like this, on a set like this, but to be a leader and to see that you are creating that experience now for the next generation of actors or below the line crew, all of that. What was that like? I mean, it's incredible. I feel like I'm just, I'm very lucky that I've been around. I've had a lot of great leaders to lead the way for me. Uh, the first movie I, the first big movie I had been with Chuck Norris uh, was with Jodie Foster, who's like just the greatest leader you could ever hope for on set. And also a queer person, and so I feel like I've had an extraordinary um, <coughs> group of folks to show me the way, so that when I was afforded that opportunity, I could try to emulate them, um, and, and to do it in a way that um, you're able to go and be friendly to everybody, and engage with everybody, and know your crew member's name, and know what everyone's job is on the set, and respect what their jobs are on the set, and respect your fellow actors, but also really tune in. I think that's a, that's a tricky thing because I spent a, a, a big portion of my career actually expending a lot of energy trying to be overly gregarious to the set and, and other people. And um, this was one of those jobs that you had to conserve. And so I think uh, this was a, a job where, and I think I learned this a lot from Brad. 
happened with my maestro right before this is how, how to be a friendly artist and collaborator, but then to really dig in once it's time to get your work done. Which is very difficult to balance, right? Yeah, it takes a while <coughs> for me. I think for a lot of people. Um, yeah. Were you involved in the casting process at all? Yeah, yeah, I did uh, a chemistry reads with Allison, with Jelani, and with Johnny. So we gotta talk about Johnny, finding Johnny, working with Johnny, just tell me everything. <laughs> Johnny was um, pretty much always at the top of my list. Um, I had a friend who sort of just refreshed my memory. I, I mentioned this project to him sort of right after I read the book, and, and they mentioned him to me, and uh, I knew his work from stage. Um, and I'd seen some of his work on uh, the Phoebe Waller-Bridge show. Crashing. Crashing, thank you. Um, Pre-Fleabag. And uh, I just thought, this guy's amazing. And he can do, he really, really changes character to character in a great way. Because, you know, you look at Anthony Bridgerton, and he's like this dashing, you know, he doesn't have a lot of Tim in him. So um, <coughs> I thought, this, this, this seems like a guy. You know, it just instantly felt like this is the dynamic we need. This is this. I, I love what he brought to the table, what he was doing take to take, and um, how he was, what his thoughts on the character were. And so it was just uh, it was kind of a done deal from there. And we just we met the first time. That was on Zoom. Yeah, so strange to do chemistry reads on Zoom. Yeah. I, I screen tested for Maestro on Zoom, which is so strange. And I was like. I don't know if any of y'all have done that yet, but I was like, do I look at the camera on the computer, or do I look at the person on the screen? And they're like, oh no, look at the camera. It's like, you don't really even have anything to respond to in the moment. Um, it was very strange, but so, and now everyone does chemistry reads um, on Zoom, as I'm sure many of you know, um, if not all of you. So, it, it, you know, it felt good on that, and then we met at a cafe in Toronto, and. Um, I think, you know, it was all landing with me, I think, a little bit earlier than it was with Johnny, because he'd just come up from Bridgerton. And I was like, I was like, can you believe what we have to do? Like, this is this is gonna be intense. And he was like, no, 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 it's good, it's good, it's good. And I was like, well, let's just make a pact. Like, you and me, whatever we do, let's just have each other's backs because, you know, we'll be working with different directors and it's gonna be really vulnerable work. And I, I, just, I just want you to know I've got you. Like, if you ever need a sidebar with me, like, and he was like, same to you. And he, he never backed down on that. The entire shoot, all six months, he always had my back. But I will tell you, when we got to set for doing the first intimacy scene, I saw him looking a little shell-shocked, and I was like, yeah. That's what I was talking about in the cafe, man. <laughs> and he, he, you know, he was great. He jumped right in. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. We'd all love to hear more about that. Um, building that, <laughs> specifically building that relationship as professionals, as colleagues, um, and then also, yes, having to do the intimacy scenes, the type of conversations you had with the intimacy coordinator, and really, I mean, we haven't seen scenes like this for main characters most of the time. No, we hadn't. It was so specific. What, what I loved about these scenes is that they were so reflective of what was going on in the, within the character. So they were intern they were an externalization of everything that was going on with them psychologically. And just given sort of the trauma and their own backstory and history that each of them had, the way they connected was therapeutic for each of them in a way. So I, I think that helped me to kind of understand it a little bit more and to be able to play in the moment with it, as opposed to have it just be some kind of stayed choreography, and Johnny did the same. And I think we knew that for it to live, we had an amazing intimacy coordinator, who she was great and amazing, but she also kind of then gave us the structure, and my favorite thing about intimacy coordinators, because I had so many years, as I'm sure all of you did, where there was no one there to help you, and you were just kind of left to your own devices, and if there's anything you needed, like if there was a, you know, now, if you, if you want mints close by, or deodorant, or if you forgot your toothbrush that day, whatever it may be, they're there to support you. If there's a place in your body you don't want to be touched, or whatever it may be, you can have that dialogue with them, and they know how to then judge that with the person 
you're working with. And that was something I was never afforded before. And so it was great to have her there in that regard and also communicating the IE here as well. Um, but then Johnny and I really, we would just huddle up, we'd powwow and kind of figure out, okay, what are we trying to do here? And what's happening? And, and then is it safe to do this or this or, and a take or whatever? And then just kind of let the moment take and I think that definitely comes across on screen as well. <coughs> so tell me more about playing Hawk because he is, like, as you said, a very layered character. He's yeah. very complicated. Um, and kind of hitting all of those shades of him, making the love story endearing and believable, but also touching upon the fact that this is very much not a perfect person. No, I think so much of it, you know, at, you know, as actors, you're always kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall and you're using backstory and you're using I do dream work, I do outside in stuff, I do inside out stuff, and you're trying to just trying to find what sticks. But one of the things that always resonated with me that really humanized him was that whole experience he has with Kenny in the first episode. It's like his rosebud, you know, he had this great love. And maybe he could have been um, a more emotionally available, vulnerable partner to someone, but in his moment of greatest intimacy, his father interrupted. I'm just sort of reiterating this whole monologue for you in case you forgot it. Kenny goes and follows him into the military, and Kenny dies in the military. And not only that, but the platoon that Hawk is leading, all of them die, or most of them die, and go that troop as well. So he has this entire history where intimacy is actually the most terrifying thing that he could possibly imagine, real intimacy. So you almost have to turn a character inside out. It's almost like, the aspects of a character that are typically more shadowy, that you think of as sort of like um, maybe the darker aspects of character, actually what he leads with, and sort of his secrets and his, his what he hides is actually his his love and care and vulnerability. So it was sort of a, a really interesting, completely polar opposite way to approach a character. And the story spans you know, decades, as you guys saw from the episode and from the beginning to end, kind of going full circle and all of that. Um, and you mentioned you were wearing prosthetics as well, and that those were difficult days when you had to go in and out of different eras. So can you elaborate on that experience and having to be the same character, but the same character 10, 20, 30 years apart in a totally different place? Yeah, you know, that's one of those, um, you, you obviously you do all the work and you, you, you think about it, and you, you study all the friends you have in your life character's age. I think I, I was the beneficiary of already being, you know, now I'm 46, and so um, I have a lot of people in my life who are Hawks age when he's in the 80s in this, and you realize they, they're not stumped over with a cane <laughs> with a limp, you know what I mean? Like, they're still active human beings doing their thing, so the, the tricky thing about a role like this is that you're actually making gradations of middle life, which is a, a much more delicate, subtle, change than if you're going from someone who's 17 to 70 or 80, you know? So um, I think a lot of it is, is in, in building that backstory and, and what's transpired in between those times fully. It takes a lot of time, you know, if you think about it. And, um, and then you really rely on your departments because you can do all of that and then you're still just in your apartment, like figuring out how you're walking and you don't believe it really completely. And then you get into the costume and you have the hair and makeup artists who are so brilliant and dedicated and they help you. And it's all those little little pieces that, that sort of tilt the scale to where you can actually get onto a set and go, okay, I, I feel like I can try to do this. Um, so that's, you know, we all know this is a total team effort. Moments like that on, on a show like this, where you realize that more than ever, you know, it, it was long hours getting your face glued together for, you know, uh, uh, you know, many many days on end. But thankfully, there were only a handful of days where we go from the 80s to the 50s, and so I mean, 
extra wrinkly, all kind of 50s, because um, that super glue doesn't wash off. Or, 